Hey, girl from EMP Reacts. I'm here today with Jake Dreyer of Witherfall. Not to talk about, well, we're going to talk a little bit about Witherfall, but to talk about you, the man, the guitar player, and the five bands, musicians that influenced you to pick up that guitar. So how are you doing? I'm doing good, man. I'm looking forward to this chat, man. I always love talking about just guitar in general. So it's, it's, it's my life, you know? <laughs> well, first of all, I want to say thank you for taking the time to chat with me about how you became a guitar player in your favorite bands or, or the five most influential bands and artists that really push you to where you are today. And thank you for that incredible guitar pick you gave me the last time I saw you in Toronto. Oh yeah, the Demon Show. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, you had a Witherfall shirt on, so I've got a <laughs> that, that have Witherfall shirts, man. Yeah, um, I, think, I think that that was the, the 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 ceiling moment is wearing that shirt, being in the front row. Yeah, absolutely, man. That was a um, what what was that venue? That was the um, oh, not the I, I remember. It's called it's cool. the uh, Danforth Music Hall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great venue, actually. That was that was a highlight of that tour. So. But yeah, so anybody that wears a Witherfall shirt, you'll get a guitar pick. <laughs> Whenever before we, we back. Before we talk about you and, and those five most influential bands for you or artists, uh, mm -hmm. let me just ask you a quick question. A Witherfall album is around the corner. What can yes. fans expect from that record? Is there any, any information you can give us about this upcoming album? Well, at the time that we're doing this interview, there's three songs already released on there. The record actually, so it was composed, of course, by Joseph and I, um, as every Witherfall record is. Uh, this one, um, it, it pretty much has, it has some songs on there that is the ones that we released earlier that are a little bit more to the point, you know, that we were, that was our whole goal though for writing it. You know, we just, we always just write what we want to hear. So we have uh, those singles out, but then there's also some stuff on there. Like there's a nine minute long song that's, completely with Witherfall and then we actually have a 15 minute long prog op opus on it that's insane and we hired um we have Anthony Crawford that's coming back on bass um he's been with us since the beginning and Marco Meneman on drums which if you're a fan of drumming on there the guy's incredible I'm sure everyone that's probably watching this right now knows who Marco is so when you guys are working on the videos for for this album or the videos in general, I always find that Winterfall videos are super artistic. There's always an artistic note to it, very intricate. There's always incredible stuff happening. Uh, uh, do you guys leave it up to the guys doing the video to kind of have a little bit of creative freedom or, or are you guys kind of pulling the strings of, of what goes on in the music videos? The music videos are, are, are different, especially with this, uh, with the As I Lie Awake video that has been out there. That was Zed Beans. He did, he worked with Ghost. And um, so Joseph and I, we always were huge fans of, uh, of those kind of like uh, videos from the 80s that had some, some sort of storyline to it. You don't really see a lot of that nowadays. I, I typically see bands that are like in a garage or some warehouse and, and there's enough of those. So <laughs> we wanted to give our, our shot at that. Now, a lot of those videos that were the great ones from the eighties had multi-million dollar budgets and we don't have that. So we had to do what we can do. And, uh, but Zeb's great. He did the, the ghost video for Dance Macabre. And, um, but we really let him kind of just take the reins of it. He wrote the script. He, you know, and a lot of the time too, we, we hire these people that we, we, we trust and we like them. Same thing that we kind of do with our, our art. We hire Christian Wallings and everything. We kind of just let him run free with it. So that's what we did with Zev as well. We, we trusted his work and we knew what he could do and we gave it to him. And now that we got the Witherfall questions out of the way, because I really wanted to pick your brain a little bit, because I know the album is around the corner. I'm really excited for this release and I just wanted to, to get as much information out of you as possible. I'm sure perhaps we'll get a chance to talk as we get closer to, to the release date. But yeah. now getting into those top five artists, I'm not gonna go on any specific order. I'm just gonna pull names out and we'll, we'll talk about each one of them. Uh, I don't want people to have an idea that this is your order. These are just your five most influential ones. And, and right. I wanna start off with Queen. Queen, I yes. Thought, I thought that was interesting. Considering you're a guitar player, uh, I thought Queen was a little bit of an interesting one. Well, Brian May is one of my favorite guitar players, and I, I think, um, <laughs> and I'm sure some people would probably disagree with this statement, but I think he's incredibly underrated, too, as a guitar player, although he's part of arguably one of the biggest rock fans of all time. 
But if, as a guitar player, if you really listen to what he does, um, and it's going to get, I'm going to get a little nerdy on this entire. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. Warm people. So, but Brian May's vibrato and his touch and his tone are completely unmatched. There's not really anybody else that can do that. And uh, of course, it comes down to his Red Special, which was the guitar he built with his dad. And the fact that he uses a pound to play with, and a lot of the time it's just kind of his fingers that he's using to get these tones. It's amazing. His harmonies also are phenomenal. It's just like an orchestra. It's a guitar orchestra is what it sounds like. So uh, that's, that's one of the reasons I really love uh, Queen. And that's not even getting into like the whole songwriting aspect too. Um, they're a huge influence on Witherfall just because uh, when you put a, a Queen record on, there's not two songs that sound the same on it. They, and the genres, they have no boundaries. It goes all over the place. Um, take a night, uh, a night at the opera, uh, for example. I mean, there's not one song on there that sounds alike. And then they do a lot of really cool stuff, like with Queen Two. Those are both my favorite, two favorite Queen records, Queen Two and A Night at the Opera. Um, the songs seamlessly blend together. It sounds like one giant long song. And uh, I thought I had never heard anything, you know, that had done anything like that before. So it has a, some of those prog elements with it. Um, and of course, yeah, Brian May's, also his guitar playing is so lyrical too. There's melodies just that are, they're, it's endless on, um, on these pieces. So he's, you know, uh, he had great technique too, very interesting technique, but also he was just a very memorable guitar player. You could sing all of his solos and it was, it's composed masterfully. How, how did Queen come into your life? How, how did you discover the band? And then obviously Brian May uh, in the process. Um, I mean, pr probably just the radio, but I remember specifically Wayne's World when they're rocking out. The <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that, uh, yeah. It, it, yeah. And I mean, and I, that song in general, I, I can listen, that song's played every day on the radio, but, um, I can listen to it all the time. Cause it's just, I, I think that scene on Wayne's World redefined Queen for a whole new generation. I think so too. Yeah. I would, I would totally agree with that. Um, th that was the one I can remember there. And then, of course, they had all, you know, tons of songs on, on the radio. Um, it, in, in the States, I mean, you couldn't you turn on the radio in your car and you're going to hear a Queen song. So I, I always loved them for that way. It wasn't until I actually really started um, playing guitar, playing lead guitar, that I was like, wow, I really love, uh, love these guitar solos. I mean, particularly uh, Killer Queen. Is just it's phenomenal. It's one of their biggest songs, but I, you know, I have no shame in saying that that guitar solo just rules. It's so uh, the, the the touch, the feel to it. The um, of course Brian May's vibrato, and then there's this whole part where he just orchestrates these harmonies that no one has really done like that definitely before, and I don't think so since. I try to, I really try to steal a lot of his shit when it comes to. These harmonies, you know, ba basically not, not just doing the Iron Maiden thing, which is like two guitar harmonies, pretty much just always like major and minor thirds, the Thin Lizzy kind of thing as well. Um, but he was adding in fists, he was adding in octaves, and it creates, it's a whole other orchestration that it creates, and it just swells in this beautiful way. So, and I, I find it, I find it amazing that Brian May was so influential on that, and also just like pretty much like a pioneer um no one was really doing that at the time and he, he took his influences of course from other things as well he, he's a he's a vocalist but um yeah i i find i just find i find queen absolutely amazing it's like one of the definitely one of my my favorite bands if not my favorite and going back to something you said earlier do, do you feel like one of the reasons that perhaps brian may doesn't get the recognition that other guitar players get is that a lot of people look at queen as Freddie mercury plus a bunch of other guys? Um, yes, yes. I, I, I do think that was the case uh, to, to, the, to the non, the non diehard Queen fan. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, I think Freddie got a lot of, a lot of the attention um, and especially just the, the tragic story around them too. I think that adds to it. Um, but and I, I think you really have to be a guitar player to really appreciate the genius of Brian May. Um, also his, his songwriting though, too, the songwriting and, and all of Queen though, if we look at that, cause all those guys wrote, I mean, John Deacon wrote arguably their biggest hits, um, the bass player. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, in Roger Taylor, I mean, the drummer, he wrote, I'm in love with my car, which is one of the best rock songs of all time. And his, his voice, they all sang. I mean, they were just, you, you don't see a band like that out anymore. So I think a lot of those guys kind of got pushed to the back because Freddie was such a big presence though, too. I mean, he, he's Freddie Mercury. He's yeah. one of the, the, I mean, he kind of wrote the book a lot for, for being a front man. I mean, he was flamboyant. He was out of control, outrageous. And, um, and a lot of those guys just, just kind of took the back seat to it. So I think you kind of had to be a really big fan of guitar to really want to try to dive in there and explore what Brian May was doing. And it's, I, I mean, and there's a lot of guitar on, on Queen stuff, like uh, people not thinking that Queen's a guitar band, um, it, it is for sure. I, I want to ask you about something you mentioned in terms of the albums being very eclectic. Queen and like Witherfall has a little bit of that. Do, do you, do, how do you create an album? Because to me, I find if the album is too eclectic and the songs change too much as you progress through the album, it starts to feel more like a compilation and less like a, a full record. So what's the secret in order for you to create an album that allows the songs to have this eclectic vibe from track to track, but at the same time, it still feels like you're listening to a full record from that band? I think that um, what probably is to go into that is that I, I know that when Witherfall, like when we write, I can't speak for Queen. I, I wish I wrote some Queen songs, <laughs> but I can't. Um, so I don't know how, how, how they pulled it off. Um, but from my own personal experience with Witherfall, when Joseph and I, when we compose these songs, we kind of have a theme in mind, um, whether it's, uh, I mean, it can be like a color. That's kind of how we, we, we did uh, the last record, Curse of Autumn, or the upcoming record. We had the color red, and that was kind of just in our head. It's not like we actually like focused on that, um, just the seeds were planted. So there's, there is kind of a, a, a theme that, that's there. There's a thread that kind of connects everything. Because I think you're right. If you have this record that's genres all over the place, it, it, it's probably like, what the fuck are these guys doing? This makes no sense. So that's just kind of how we do it. I, I think that, and, and some people might argue, yeah, there's too much crazy shit on it, but we like that. You know, <laughs> we, we like it's it's part of who you guys are. Yeah, we, we never want to have a record that's you put it on and it's, and it's like the same tracks the entire time. That, that's boring to us. Um, I don't want to listen to the same song over. I want a, I want a record that, that takes me on a, a journey. Um, it, to me, I, and I think it's been lost a lot of the time too, is that you used to put on vinyls and you, it'd be like watching a movie. You know, you took the time out of the day to listen to the hour long, uh, the, the hour long album. Mm -hmm. So um, we like to have that. It, it's like, you know, it's going to take you on different, different moods, different scenes, you know, um, different emotions that are going to be coming out. So. I think that that to me is a record I like. Before we go into the next band, I want to ask you about yourself as a guitar player. How old were you when you picked up the guitar? Um, when I was a kid, um, I've always been attracted to the guitar. My dad, um, he used to just have, uh, he had a Fender Strat. I used to be around and he used to play it after work. And I always just thought it was super cool. I loved how it looked. I loved the sound that came from it. Um, I, uh, my, my, the first band that I, I absolutely fell in love with was Kiss when I was like around two years old or so. I loved the way that, that the whole imagery of it, they were like superheroes. Um, but then I started playing, uh, I started taking guitar lessons at eight. I, uh, never practiced though. I just didn't, I liked the lessons, but I never practiced. So it was completely a waste of money for my parents. And they were like, okay. Sounds, it sounds like my son. Yeah, I mean, it's common with most kids, you know, I think, because it's, and, and the practicing, when you're first starting out like that, it's, it's kind of like anything. It's like learning anything new. It, it sucks, and you have these, you have to basically really kind of have these little tiny, uh, tiny, very minuscule goals so that you can continue pushing on. So um, when I was 10, I picked it back up, and, um, and then I just started practicing. I, I started with uh, uh, ACDC I fell in love with and then when I was 14 I discovered Ingbe and I just locked myself in my room and this practice for eight hours a day all throughout high school had no social life at all no parties it was just me in my room practicing nonstop. so that's that's I mean that's kind of like until I went off the the music school and then how old were you when when you felt like okay I'm good enough now that I can be in a band <laughs> well and I was 11, 
um, <laughs> I formed the band with, uh, and not, not that I felt I was good enough. Um, I formed the band with, uh, this kid and in, uh, in school and it was just a guitar player and a drummer. And we, we play, <laughs> God, we were fucking terrible. We played. <laughs> you, you, know, you, sound, you sound like my kid, my kid gems with his buddy. Who's a drummer. It's just the two of yeah. them. So, so they, they call themselves like, you know, noise metal because that's pretty much all they do is noise. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's what we were doing too, but we actually play like school dances and shit. And, but they were, they were God awful. I think we played like half of back in black. Like we just did half of the song as a, as a song that was part of our set. And then like, I don't know, we had like some original that we were like writing on the spot, like <laughs> fucking terrible. So, I mean, that wasn't really my first band. When I was like 13, I recorded my first CD with a, a band I had and um, it, it, it was terrible, you know, it's like, but you know, I, I, I mean, that's the thing is with, with myself, I, listen, I look back at everything I've done and I can always find some sort of flaw with it. You know, it's yeah, nothing very critical. Yeah, exactly. It's, and I think you know, you're, you're, you are your own worst critic. At least I hope <laughs> there's not someone out there who thinks that it's worse than what I think of it. <laughs> um, you, know. you know, maybe one day you have to release some of those demos. If you have some, somebody recorded something of you playing in your, in, in your little band, in your two. Uh, everyone will, will purposely make themselves deaf if they hear that. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think we're ever going to see the light of day on those. So moving on to a band you, that you mentioned already, Kiss, uh, it, they had an impact. You said like at the age of two or three, you started listening uh, and you enjoyed it. So what, was it the, the, the makeup and, and the whole spectacle that attracted you to Kiss? Yeah, it, it was for sure. My, my dad had um, a whole bunch of vinyl that he had. And um, I, I found a, a copy of Destroyer. And I just thought that, I mean, it looked like superheroes on that cover. It's a fucking awesome, awesome cover. And um, so, of course, the aesthetic of it, I loved. And uh, when I was a kid, I used to just go around to, I always wanted to go to the CD, CD store and find Kiss records. And I'd just find which one um, had the coolest looking cover. <laughs> and, I, and I'd buy it. And I remember one time I, I went there and I... <laughs> I picked up a copy of the elder and my dad was like, you, you don't want that one. <laughs> Put that back. But, um, yeah, so, but, but that was the thing with kiss too, is I also loved the music. I, I loved, I, I loved how catchy it was. And kiss is basically, um, it's a, kind of like a heavier, darker version of the Beatles. There's it's super poppy, tons of catchy songs with them. Ace Fraley, awesome guitar player there's really no one else that kind of sounds like ace he had his own speaking of his vibrato a lot of these guys will talk about have their own vibrato which to me is that's basically like your characteristic of being a guitar player ace had it um he had the attitude too you could you could hear it a lot in his playing um especially like on like a live and a live two both awesome records where um well on the live two the songs that ace actually played because bob kulik <laughs> went in and did some overdubs for them. Um, but uh, um, yeah, I, I just, I, I loved, of course I loved like the, the whole show aspect of it as well, watching co old concerts and stuff of them, you know, the fire, the Gene Simmons with the blood and all that kind of shit. As a young kid, that's awesome. But I think you got to get into Kiss. Are you a Kiss fan at all? No, I was just gonna say, I, <laughs> okay, I, yeah. I, 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 I was just gonna um, say, I'm gonna get tons of hate for this. It's one of, to me there are two bands out there that everybody loves and for some reason i just can't I, I just can't get into them kiss being one of them and the other one is rush which just by saying that I, i'm sure the canadian authorities are going to revoke my passport but yeah man, you, you better watch out for the door <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh well what i was going to say too is is kiss i think a lot of you have to get into kiss at a young age i feel like for for now because it, it, it is it's um Hey, look, I, I've, I've toured with many guys and there's been many late night drunken, you know, bus shenanigans going on and we'll put on Kiss and half the room clears out, you know, everyone's like, okay, time to go to our bunks and go to bed. And the other half is out there raging to it. So it's, Kiss is one of those bands, I think, to me, I found it very young and I absolutely loved it. So 
Um, and I, I still, I mean, I, I still want to, I just watched a kiss new year's thing that happened, you know? Um, so it, I, I've noticed it with a, a, quite a few people that they either, they either like it or they don't get it. Do you find them to be that polarizing? And, and, and the question I have to follow up with that is, uh, you, you, because I feel right now the band that does that a lot to people that either you love them or you hate them. There's no middle ground is ghost. And I think there's a lot of similarities between them, not necessarily because of the makeup. I, I, I hate when people always take that avenue. I don't, I don't think from that perspective, but from the whole stage, from the whole construction of the records, the, how poppy some of the songs are, like you said, I think there's a lot of similarities between those two bands. And I think those are two bands that are very like create these polar opposites. Either people love them or they just absolutely hate them. I, I think uh, if, I, I'm sure if I if I fuck this up, someone's gonna say it. But I think that the guy from Ghost, Tobias, has has flat out said that he his biggest influence is Kiss. Like it, it's like he wanted to form a a version of Kiss. I mean, look at it too. They they almost follow the playbook to it. To an, they had these years where they have you know they're trying to be all the the uh, they wear masks of course, but they do it and then it leaks out who the main guy is and. I mean, it, it goes right by the playbook of it. And I think it's really cool, too. I, I mean, I'm one of those guys, too, when it comes to ghosts. I like them. I, I don't love them. I, I, I have a friend that, um, that has seen them, that follows them around, like almost like a, a Grateful Dead type thing. But uh, <laughs> to me, I'm not one of those. I do appreciate they're bringing back um, the huge production that I think is missing from a lot of rock. Um, and of course that comes down to a lot of the budget too, you know, a lot of it's, it's, uh, it's very expensive to do all that stuff. So I think it's really cool that they're investing that much into the show. Um, and I respect them for that. And I, and yeah, I, I think it's cool. Some of their imagery and I, I think some of their songs are pretty cool too. Another band that it's on your list and you already mentioned it is ACDC. Yes. Uh, before I ask you how ACDC got to you, uh, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of how they got to me. And that was watching Thunderstruck, the video. When oh, yeah, saw, yeah, yeah. yeah, when I saw Angus Young doing the, the, the little guitar walk thing, I was, like, walk, yeah. I was like, you know what, I'm, I'm, I, I don't care about anything else. Who's this guy? Who's this band? I need to listen to more. And I remember being a really, I, I was a young kid when I saw that video. I was a teenager uh, and I was home from school having lunch and, and the video popped up like on TV and, and I, was, I, was, I was done. I was like, okay, this is it. Well, well, that video too, it's got all the people like on the sides too. Yeah, like, like they're in prison yeah. or something. It's just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. like Thunderdome, you know, it has this yeah, Mad Max exactly. Thunderdome feel to it. That might've been the first ACDC video I saw actually, um, that, that really got, got me into it. Cause that was off of Razor's Edge, correct? Razor's Edge. Yes. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I remember too, because Chris Slade had the, the two giant kick drums up on like, you know, he had the, he, of course he had the one that he was playing doing his, his foot pedal with, but he had these two that he was doing the, yeah. you know, under with. So um, I always thought that was badass. And then Angus Young, I mean, Angus is the guy that made me want to play lead guitar because I, I you know, you, you watch these, uh, all the ACDC videos and the live stuff too. And it's like, Angus is the one the center of attention. He's all over the place and, and he's doing the coolest shit. And, um, the song that actually made me want to play guitar was, um, again, I was in the Kiss for a while and, and of course thought the guitar was cool, loved the music, loved concerts. And then, uh, but when I heard the intro to Hell's Bells, which is actually Malcolm Young, I was like, that gave me, you know, the, the hair on my, my arm stood up and I was like, that is the coolest shit I've ever heard in my life. Like, what is that? And um, yeah, I remember, uh, just obsessing over that. And then ACDC became my life. I mean, Angus and I bought all the records. I obsessed over the stuff. Um, I used to be more of a fan of the Brian Johnson era back then, but now I'm, I'm a Bon Scott guy. That's the like powerage. Oh, really? That's interesting. Yeah. Do, do, you, do you remember the first, the first ACD song that you learned how to play? I, uh, yeah, I, uh, <laughs> I had a guitar t-shirt that had, um, of course, I wanted to learn Hell's Bells. I took the, I took the guitar lessons, and that, that's when I was 10. So when I was eight, I think I was not really, I just wanted to play guitar. Uh, 10 was when I listened to the ACDC stuff, and I was like, whoa, like I, this is what I want to do. Um, so I practiced enough, and I'm pretty sure I tried to learn the version of Hell's Bells, but the guy had taught me it wrong. 
<laughs> it wasn't right. <laughs> so um, I, I think Back in Black was probably the one after that. You know, that, that one's pretty much, I think every guitar player, rock guitar player out there played that one. And so I'm pretty sure that's, that's the one that, that I, uh, I first got my fingers under. And of course, when I was playing in the band, I wasn't even playing it right. I played half the song and was like, Yeah, you were playing only half. Yeah, exactly. It was, it was only back. It was, it, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It, it was the radio version of it. Yeah, it was the radio edit. Yeah. Uh, you know, like it, it was too long for radio, so they did an edit. And you only, <laughs> yeah, exactly. you, only did, you only did half. Yeah. So I think, I think it was that one. Um, I could be wrong. I remember learning uh, that band also, we played uh, Livewire off of a high voltage and we had no vocalist though. So, I mean, that song's not really a great like instrumental song, it's just <laughs> fucking blues. So I'm sure that probably, I'm, I'm sure the, uh, the 11 year old little girls and all that kind of stuff that were at the school dance loved this instrumental blues by, you know, a bunch of old guys. That <laughs> I, I'm sure you got tons of dates from it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, but I, I've learned so many ACDC songs throughout the years. E e every, even now, you know, super late at night, I'll put on an ACDC record and just jam along to it, you know, because it's, it's just, it's great shit. And, and to really get what, what Malcolm is doing on the, I don't think Malcolm gets enough credit. I think he's extremely underrated. As a rhythm guitar player, he was the backbone behind that band. And to get his rhythms correct is super difficult. That is, he, he was a, he was a monster. I think Angus has such a, a larger than life personality that oh, he yeah. just takes the spotlight is, I mean, they're one of those bands that you forget about the front man. You, you only care about is Angus Young. You just want to look yeah. at him and see what he's doing, which is really yeah. weird because normally when you go to a show, your eyes are always focused on the front man or him singing what he's doing. But they're one of those bands that you almost forget about that and you just concentrate on him. So Malcolm kind of also took the, a little bit of the back seat because of it. He did, yeah, and, and and him and Cliff, uh, Cliff Williams. When Cliff Williams was playing with them, I, I know that they got another bass player. I can't. It's on the top of my head now for a little bit, but uh, like uh, th their harmonies too, though too, like their vocal harmonies that they would add to it were, were a difference. I mean, you can listen to an ACDC song and you hear those. That's one of the signature sounds. Um, you know, when you're looking at the whole the whole band aspect to it, I mean, they were just a phenomenal band. Phil Rudd on drums. Uh, the the way that he grooves with it, his feeling is so right on, you know. And it's like you couldn't really put any other people in that that group to get that type of sound. And again, like you were saying too, that the the actual stage performance aspect of ACDC and their stage presence that that was one that made me really want to become a lead guitar player because I was like, and made me want to become a you know a lead guitar player that ran around the stage. That's why I did that stuff. You know, I remember one time I was playing in a band. And um, <laughs> I got told by the vocalist, you're upstaging me. And I'm like, well, try harder, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> fucking, you know, that, that's how you get a good show going on is, you know, when one's trying to outdo the other, you know? Um, and I, I think I could see that a lot with Brian Johnson and Angus. And like you were saying, Angus always kind of took it, but I think Brian was a great front man and, you know, they, they played off each other and it yeah. was... Yeah, and he just said so many signature things, man. I mean, the Chuck, I mean, he got that from Chuck Berry, that duck walk, but that was like, I mean, shit, all that stuff is super signature. When he does the strip during the Jack and all this kind of shit, it's just like ACDC also created just that, that kind of rock and roll sleazy vibe too, which is. <laughs> I, lo I love how you put it, sleazy vibe, but yeah, totally. I totally feel that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, they're, they're phenomenal, man. I mean, I, I don't love all their records, um, but the ones that I do really, I mean, you know, they're, every, every album's got, got a, some cool songs on it, you know, but ones from like, you know, front to back, I mean, shit, Highway to Hell, it's got Touch Too Much, Walk All Over You, I mean, some of those songs are just, they're, they're phenomenal, man. Yeah, and, and they're, they're a great live band. band. I mean, if, you, if you've ever had a chance to see them live, no, no, ever live had, man. holy crap, they, like, you, you really get your money's worth. Oh, I can imagine, man. They played, they, um, they played Los Angeles, but I was on tour at the time and couldn't, and couldn't go see them. But um, I, I was bummed about that too, because that was, that's always been a band on my bucket list to go see. And Malcolm was playing with them at that point, which unfortunately now, even if they go tour, whenever the hell it's possible, he's not going to be there. So. Yeah. I saw them on tour. Wow. One, I don't know. Like, Eight years ago, or whatever, the last time they were on tour, um, 
and uh, it was it was at the Sky Dome back then? It was the Sky Dome here in Toronto? I mean, it's like a baseball stadium. It was packed, oh, and yeah. it was just like it was definitely my bucket list. And I was so happy to be there. And it was just an incredible and it just just a show. You don't you don't know where where to look at. You know what I mean? Like there's so many things yeah. happening, and there's so many things for you to digest during their performance. There, you just like oh, like, where do I go? Like, where do my eyes go? Like, there's just so many things happening. And there's such a tight band, great, great live sound. Oh, yeah, they, they sound, they, they sound, what, what, what tour was that that you saw them on? Black Ice, I think that was the... Black Ice, Ice. okay, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that was, oh, shit, I can't remember. I don't even was. remember how long ago it was, but it's got to be like 80 years ago or something like that. Yeah, 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 that makes sense. And, um, but yeah, they, I, I mean, that's the thing is ACDC just, I, I mean, there, there's no other band like them. They, they completely broke them all, and there, there always will be just ACDC. And, um, so let me ask you this. Who, who inspired you? Before we get to the last two on your list, who, mm-hmm. inspi- like, who inspired you? Because I, I've seen you live multiple times now, and every time I see you play live, you always come on stage with your shirt unbuttoned all the way down, a very Italian, <laughs> a very Italian look, if, if yeah. you know what I'm saying, like a wise guy kind of look. And you're playing and your hair is flowing in the breeze uh, provided by the fans, but in the breeze. Yeah. And you have this, this majestical look as you're playing. Who inspired you to have that kind of look and feel? Or is that something that's just who you are? Uh, it's kind of who I am, but I, I like the – I'd always thought Joe Perry from Aerosmith was the coolest looking guitar player. Like, and he kind of just had that, you know? Um, uh, Joe Perry, like again, going back to Aerosmith, there's a, um, I, I'm sorry, not Aerosmith. It is Aerosmith, but going back to Wayne's world when Aerosmith's on stage, I remember seeing that and just being like, and it was, it was in broad daylight too. And just being like, fuck, that guy looks cool. Like that guy just looks awesome with the guitar player. You know, he had the Les Paul and stuff and <laughs> the fucking shirt undone and all that kind of shit. So, I mean, that does part of it too. And, and a lot of, um, I mean, a lot of my, the guys I like and stuff are all from the seventies and eighties. And that was kind of like their, their yeah, look. Was definitely <laughs> the look. Yeah. Yeah. So that was, I remember it, the last time I saw you was, live, I was telling the guy next to me, I think Jake is allergic to buttons because I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know, especially the medical condition. Hey, as, as more drinks get, get, you know, get on a night, you, <laughs> you'll, you'll have to talk to Joseph about some stories. My God. But, um, I, uh, but yeah, that, uh, so yeah, I mean, Joe Perry was another one too, but um, not, not with like the playing aspect. He, he's a fucking great guitar player, but um, his, his persona, I thought, was, was really cool, you know? Um, there's a few guys that, are, that just look like, look like rock stars and have that, you know, that, that's, that's part of it too, man. You know, it's kind of like having that vibe um, and that aura. So, uh, you know, if you're going to steal, steal from the best. You know? <laughs> Yeah, you can't just play it. You have to kind of bring it. It's all about the attitude as well. I think that that helps that 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 charisma, that personality, that flamboyant feel. It, mm-hmm. it, it yeah. almost kind of goes hand in hand. Yeah, and I mean, and at the end of the day, too, you're going to a rock show. You know, it's um, that that's something that I think a lot of people kind of. Uh, if you just go up there and you hear shit that sounds exactly like, I'm sorry about that, it's exactly like the. Uh, the recording that's going on it's uh you can just listen to that in your bedroom you know mm-hmm. you want to go there and have an experience and, and maybe hear some stuff that's a little bit different um and and then at the end of the day just be entertained you know at the same time also you know don't fuck your parts up either practicing so <laughs> i hear you uh, next on your list as we're Sorry. winding down to the last two is uh vingy malmstein uh, I, I was not shocked at all that, that this name made your list. I, I don't think you can talk to any guitar player and not have his name somehow come up. Well, yeah, Ingve, uh, again, that was a game changer for me. That was a guy that, um, that basically caused me to go in there and lock myself in my, in my bedroom and just play constantly all, all the time because, um, there, I was always a big fan of kind of like that of, of classical music. Um, I didn't really know it at that point, but and of course, as I, as I learned a lot of music theory and studied it, I figured out that was a sound, you know, the harmonic minor um, or Phrygian dominance, the same thing, depending on how you're looking at it. But 
uh, that sound. And then I loved a lot of like this, uh, of flamenco guitar music as well, which is kind of the same thing. And then Yngwie did it, you know, with the electric guitar and all the aspect of like what I loved with like ACDC and Kiss, but here he is. And I mean, <laughs> back in the day, he used to have his shirt down. I don't know if he wants to do <laughs> more, <laughs> but um, yeah. And uh, I mean, I, I love that stuff. I absolutely loved it. I loved the, f- the feel to it. I loved his vibrato. I loved everything that he did. And um, to this day, I'm still trying to get, you know, how he did some of this stuff. He was uh, from, from a guitar technique level, he was, he innovated so many ways, like his mechanisms of playing too are, are, they're brilliant, you know, and how he was able to achieve these sounds. And, um, and he came, of course, from Richie Blackmore and that kind of, it, which kind of, which, which did have some neoclassical elements to it as well in, in Only John Rock, but he took it, I mean, Yngwie did, Yngwie stuff is if you look at a classical score, he was like, I'm going to take that lick from Beethoven uh, this thing from from Bach and you know that that's what it is it's classical music um, that to me was was super attractive and I, I love the way it sounds and to this day I still do it I haven't grown out of that you know um, is, certainly is, is he a difficult guy in terms of like you as a guitar player coming up you start you start listening to this guy and, and you're like oh I want to sound like that but then you start to realize that he's so unique in his own way that it doesn't matter almost how much you try you start to kind of feel a little bit deflated because you can't reach the him. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Like, do you feel like that sometimes can become a problem or, or you were more like, can I learn from him and then incorporate it in my own style? Oh, it, well, yeah, the, the latter of it, because that, that's always kind of the goal. I don't want to be a carbon copy of anybody, you know? Um, there already is an Yngwie and there are no one can, no one can out, can out be Yngwie, you know? Um, and, and and so, but it's taking the aspects that I really love about that and then taking aspects of like uh, Marty Friedman or Brian May and then incorporating all those influences and creating my own sound. Um, that really, that's really kind of my formula for, for myself as far as trying to get my own thing. And sure, I mean, I steal Yngwie licks all the time and, um, and they don't sound like Yngwie because I'm playing it, you know, on a different guitar than what he's doing or it's like, or my the way I just play my, my fingers, you know, everyone sounds different. Um, even if I were to play through Yngwie's rig, um, he, he'd probably be pretty fucking pissed off first, but he wouldn't, <laughs> it wouldn't sound like him, you know? Um, but there is definitely, I mean, he's a massive influence on that. I mean, he's probably the guy that I, I sit there still to this day and slow down the stuff, try to figure out exactly how he's doing it. And then I just, you know, at the end of the night, I throw my guitar down and I'm just like, fuck, how did, I mean, <laughs> especially when I was like around his age, when he did um, Rising, when he did Alcatraz. And I'm like, I, I, I'm the same age as this guy, you know? And I'm like, what the fuck? How did he come up with this stuff that I'm trying to figure out at, at this point? So yeah, he's, he, he's just, it's amazing. And again, all these guys that I've kind of mentioned have all been kind of innovative in their own way. Um, with whether it's their appearance or uh, their playing. So and, yeah. And last on your list, last but not least, Guns N' Roses. Now, was Guns N' Roses an influence on you because of Slash on guitar or you were just a big fan of the overall sound and everything that they created? Um, basically, like, um, it kind of went the same thing with, uh, going back to that Kiss record, my dad had a copy of Appetite and I, I, I thought the album cover looked killer and I flip it over and I see these, these guys that look like they've just been through hell on the back. Like, you know, fucking half empty bottle of Jack and all this kind of shit. <laughs> Probably not best for like a five-year-old to see, but I was like, these guys look fucking cool, you know? <laughs> and, yeah, this um, is rock and roll. <laughs> oh yeah. Talk about sleaze factor. And, um, and I was like, these guys are, this looks cool. And then, um, and of course, listening to the songs off off Appetite are, are, are great. You know, they're, that record just sounds incredible the way it is. I mean, that should never be touched. It should never be redone. It should never be anything. Um, and so I, I love the songs at first, but it was um, a, another moment where I wanted to play the guitar was I was at taking guitar lessons at this local um, place called B and H Music in Panama City, Florida, where I'm from. And um, I was like around. 11 or 12 or so and um 
I was taking lessons with this guy that was very theory oriented. And I was a young kid. I, I wanted to play like ACDC songs and shit. And I was like, I don't care about this theory shit. And in the next room over, I heard this sound. And it was, uh, and it turned out to be estranged. The guy was teaching that. And um, at that time, there was no YouTube or anything. So it's not like, I didn't even know what the fucking song was. I was just like, whatever that sound is. I went to bed that night thinking like, fuck, that was the coolest thing ever. Yeah, there was no um, Zen. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I still don't even know how to use Shazam. I wanted to use it last night, um, but it didn't work. But uh, but then that later on that year, that Christmas, my mom got me Use Your Illusions, um, the live uh, video from Tokyo. And it was a DVD at that point. And the song that plays at the opening menu there was estranged. And I was like, you got to be fucking kidding me. That's what I want. So I went through the whole thing and I found it and I was like, there it is. That's estranged. And, um, yeah, that, that song, because that has some, some killer shit that Slash plays on it. And the first solo in that is, it's so melodic. It's, it's made. I learned it up and down, played it all the time. And, um, and it, I think that aspect Slash also does some really cool kind of shit too. That that's basically a lot of, and I know people are going to say Slash and they shouldn't be in the same sentence, but a lot of the stuff that he does, which is kind of like this, this thing floating over the time and Slash does this kind of thing that like also Richie Blackmore would do, or it kind of sound, I call it whenever I'm recording, I'm like the falling down the stairs aspect. Cause it's like, it's not perfectly in time, but it has this really cool effect mm -hmm. and it's like a stuttering kind of thing. And it, to my ears, I love that. I thought that was one of the coolest things in the guitar solo. So it, it's funny how I see that with a lot of these guys, Brian May does it as well. Um, so it's, that was one thing that I really loved was, was that. And, it, and also, I mean, Slash had a cool look too on stage. I was just going to say, talk about a guy, never mind the button down shirt. Like the guy would be shirtless. He'd be shirtless or I mean, fuck, I've seen, I, I've seen videos of him with like short shorts and a sombrero on and it's still yeah, cool. like boxers or something like boxer briefs. <laughs> yeah. <on. laughs> yeah. I mean, it, I mean, that just shows, I mean, that's just, he was born to do that. You know, I mean, he's such an iconic looking and it, even without the top hat and everything. So, um, as a kid, I, I really loved, I, I loved, uh, the, the, all the Guns N' Roses stuff. I, I, and I, again, I liked Slash. I liked Angus, Slash, and, and Ace Fraley. I mean, geez, that's a dime of dime. Every other guitar player around here would be like, oh yeah, I love those guys too, you know? Um, so it's no one, I mean, I love a lot of obscure guys too, but that's a whole other conversation, you know? Um, but yeah, I mean, those were the guys that made me want to play, play guitar. And, uh, and again, I was back in, you know, I, I've, I've grown a little bit more as, as my taste, but that was when I was, my, my formative years of, of what made me actually become the guitar player I am now. Well, and you're a great guitar player. And, and, I, and I want to thank you once again for taking the time today to chat with me uh, about oh, your you, idols and, and your favorite bands. This was, this was so much fun. Uh, we have to do some great again. Man when Wither Falls album comes out, have a chat, uh, maybe have Joseph on the chat, like the three of us can have a, a threesome. That'd oh, be that great. Sounded, that, sounded, that sounded dirty. <laughs> we'll, we'll make it non-dirty. I, I don't know if that's possible, actually. That sounded good in my head until I said it. And then when I said <laughs> it, I was like, okay, that didn't sound good. It sounded better just in, when I was thinking about it. Don't worry, man. Shit sounds good in my head all the time. And then I, I say it or I play it and I'm like, fuck. That was the wrong idea. But, uh, well, cool, man. Well, I, I really appreciate you having me on, man. And yeah, we'll do this again, man. Coming up All soon, right. man. Okay, take care, man.